I started to speak in English at the time. Speak. I can read Croatian because I can work out it was similar to Russian. Well, uh, I suggested I should say something about the British reaction or even non-reaction to what we're all here assembled for, the blind world tragedy and the other related tragedies of the Russians, Cossacks and other people um, handed over to the tortured or killed or um, killed or put into slave labor camps in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, <clears throat> I, because of my Russian background, I suppose I became drawn to this subject at quite an early stage, but I never thought of writing a book about it until I think it was about 1973 when I learned that the British government was releasing documents into the public domain, the public record office. Um, and I thought, well, I'll go and look at them. And when I saw what was there, even though that's the very beginning of everything that I did, um, I thought, well, there's quite enough here now to, um, to write a book about it. And so I prepared to write the book. I never thought it would take quite as long as it did. In the end, it was not only all these uh, official documents, military and the foreign office that I had to read, but I then realized that, of course, many people were alive who were involved in these events. And uh, though I couldn't at that time, obviously, go to the Soviet Union or to Yugoslavia to conduct research, I was able to find, because it wasn't so very long after the time when these events happened, many, many people who were either victims or uh, Serbs. I know at that time I was only writing about the Cossacks, so there were Russians who managed to escape. There were many British soldiers whom I interviewed uh, of all ranks, so I was able to bring all these accounts together and compare them with the, the military and diplomatic documents. And also, of course, I had to write about the American side of the operations. Um, they, when, after my book was published, a book was published by um, an American uh, historian, Mark Elliott, called Pawns of Yalta, which deals entirely with the American side, uh, much more thoroughly than I was able to do in my book. Um, when the book was finally, it took me a long time to write, it came out at the beginning of 1978. Um, I, um, I have to say that the reaction was very favorable. The, um, the, great, the reviews in the newspapers and uh, the general public were very supportive. In fact, horrified at what had been done, secretly, uh, and without anyone being consulted. Uh, a crime involving the deaths and sufferings of hundreds of thousands of people, which the British people were really not aware of until this, the, the beginning of the 1970s. And um, I, uh, so much so that um, uh, a committee was got up of members of both houses of parliament and of all the three then major political parties to erect a memorial, so this follows quite aptly on our previous speaker, a memorial to what were now known from my book as the victims of Yalta because of the infamous Yalta Agreement. And uh, a, 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 an appeal was set up, <coughs> and, um, but I heard afterwards that the, um, uh, the, the, the um, a friend of mine who was the secretary of the appeal uh, told me one day he had a letter from the Foreign Office saying they didn't want the <coughs> monument in the middle of London, it was to be put and they said why it could be somewhere far in the West London, in other words in a place where nobody would ever visit and with any luck it would be forgotten. Um, uh, just at that time, I think in the same week, my friend had received a contribution of £200 from a rather distinguished public figure, in fact it came from Mrs Thatcher, who sent her a letter from 10 Downing Street and said, I'm enclosing this money for your appeal. And my friend wrote back to the Foreign Office and said, uh, sent a photocopy of Mrs. Thatcher's letter and said, I think you might be interested to see this copy of this letter. Straight away he got a letter back saying, and of course we never really meant for you to have the monument anywhere else and we're very happy with it being in the middle of London. They're not only very um, callous people, but when they're pressed, I find rather cowardly. Um, 
Well, I felt that for a while, I forget a few years, that I'd done my duty as far as I could. The book seemed to me to encompass all aspects of the um, repatriations, including those even not only from, uh, handed back by the British and the Americans, nearly two and a quarter million people handed over for, to be slave labor. It's the last great uh, slave trading operation in history, I hope. Um, but also the neutral countries, whose reactions vary very much. The Swedes, who are not, in modern history anyway, very much renowned for their courage, and who had helped the Nazis to get through Sweden to attack Norway in the back in 1940. As the war began to go against the Germans, then they suddenly became amazingly pro-Soviet. And they handed over people who were not Soviet citizens, because they didn't have any but people who managed to get across the Baltic from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. They weren't even covered by any agreement to be sent back to the countries which had been occupied by the Soviets when they were allies of the Nazis. But nevertheless, the Swedes sent them back. And I have read good authority and published in my book that in return, the Soviets gave them a million tons of Polish coal so the Swedes could keep up their high standard of living through the coming winter. Uh, so, but one country we've already heard, so I don't need to repeat it, was Liechtenstein, which flatly refused to hand anyone over who didn't wish to go, and go over. And I went to Liechtenstein, and met the Prince, the Prime Minister, and General Smyslovsky, the Russian commander, who luckily happened to have returned from Argentina, where he'd settled to be there, so I got a very full picture of it. And this part of the story was to come back into my life in a very helpful way later on. Um, but then I began to I, um, have friends saying to me who were, uh, I think it was a, first of all, a Serbian former Chetnik, who said to me, Nikolai, why don't you write about our tragedy, the tragedy of the peoples of Yugoslavia, because after all we suffered the same, similar fate at the same time and even in the same place, and from the same place in Austria. And my first reaction was to say, well, I, I don't know enough about it, and I'm, I, I would have thought that it would be better for a Serbian or Croatian, <coughs> sorry, historian to write about it. But then this stayed in my mind, and I realized more information began to come my way. And then I finally thought, well, if I go into this, <coughs> There are many aspects of the repatriation in Austria which still remain mysterious to me. And um, this might throw further light. After all, the same people were involved in making the decisions on the British side. So I did. But then I, as I went into it, I realized it wasn't just important because it illustrated what happened to the Cossacks, but it was very important in its own right. A huge number of people, as we've <coughs> described, suffered. Uh, as a result of being either driven back at Bayburg or subsequently handed over from Austria during May 1945. And so I sat down to write the book and it took again several years. And then and I also found that the evidence pointed, <coughs> all everything I've seen since <coughs> suggests that I was right, in thinking that the man ultimately responsible for what happened was not Churchill. <clears throat> or and um, still less Truman, um, but because it was they, it was Churchill certainly was very much against handing over the Cossacks. I've no evidence that I, I've never seen any evidence of his even being aware of the handovers of the Yugoslav people. It was simply kept from him. Uh, so the, the man responsible, in my view, anyway, and in the book I explained why was Harold Macmillan, who was then the political advisor in the Mediterranean. Now when the book came out, this time, instead of getting general approval, it got, did get approval from many readers and reviewers, but the government became uh, absolutely outraged at this challenge to Macmillan. And um, not that they could have, at first that they could do anything about it, but then circumstances rather played into their hands because it would have been about um, uh, in the, well, the book came out, I think, in 1985, yes, so it wasn't very long afterwards. But someone got in touch with me, who was of many people who wrote to me, saying, I'm very concerned about all this. And he said, um, it seems monstrous that these people, uh, the British figures, 
the two most important of whom were, who were still alive were Harold Macmillan and a man called Lord Aldington, who in 1945 was Brigadier, the Chief of Staff at Octavia Lowe, who actually signed and issued the orders which resulted in all this suffering. And he said, uh, I think these people, he, they were, uh, this man, Lord Aldington, was a war criminal. And I said, well, obviously, I agree with you, but no doubt he was, but he's not going to be punished because this is Britain. Um, and he said, well, I think I'll send out a leaflet which will set out uh, the charges against Lord Aldington. And Lord Aldington was governor of one of Britain's most famous public schools, Winchester. And he said, I'll send it to all the parents, all the old boys, and all the existing government and staff, I think, at the school too. So I said, well, Unfortunately, my book hasn't really produced any concrete effect in that respect, so I have a horrid feeling your leaflet may not either. Then he sent me, I said, but send it to me so I can see you get the facts right. He sent me a copy, and, of course, and he got everything wrong. There were awful mistakes which his enemies, our enemies, would have taken advantage of. So I thought, well, it's only two sides of an A4 sheet of paper. I'll write it for him. So I wrote it and sent it to him. It didn't have my name on because he wanted to do it himself. He sent it out. And um, before long, I won't go into all the details, but we found out that terrific pressure was applied to law on Lord Aldrington. Many of the people who received it, parents and little boys and so on, were horrified and said that unless he can answer this, he should have uh, resigned. And so he was pretty well forced into suing this man, Mr. Watson, is called. Uh, but when I heard that he was being sued, I knew the poor man who was not a historian and didn't really know anything except what I told him or what he'd read about it. So my, I consulted my lawyers and they said, well, if you join your name, as is in legal terms, to the defense, um, then Lord Aldington will have to sue you. And I said, all right, well, let's, then we'll please do that. So they wrote to him and said, we're sure you would like to know that our client has uh, which is to be joined to the defence. He wrote the pamphlet, so in fact, obviously he's responsible. But they wrote the first time, the Ordington's lawyers wrote back and said, no, 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 our client has no quarrel with Count Tolstoy. He doesn't want to see him at all. Twice he wrote. The third time, my lawyers wrote and said, well, then if he won't agree, we will go to court and force him to, and apparently that can be found. Um, so I found myself sued for libel by uh, Lord Orlington. Well, to be honest, I was quite pleased because I thought this week um, this still hasn't um, been properly settled in Britain, and this there won't be a proper trial, won't be a trial of Lord Orlington, but it will be a public trial where the evidence can be brought out, and this is Britain, so it will be a fair trial, and the evidence is so overwhelming um, that this, I think it will make people realise even better than my book, perhaps. Uh, what, what happened. Also, we will be able to produce witnesses who are uh, survivors, well, many of them are people who escaped from the operations, but also included British soldiers who were uh, outraged by what had been done, what they'd been forced to do or to connive at anyway. Um, but I remember I had an, uh, a warning shot across my bows. I had a letter from a distant cousin of mine, Russian, Prince Georgi Vasilchikov, and he simply wrote, Nikolai, please be careful. The British establishment, when it turns nasty, can turn very nasty indeed. And, uh, well, I thought, I don't think I was too alarmed because I thought, well, he doesn't live in England and I, I was born there. I think that British justice works really, very well indeed. Well, I won't go into the, the trial itself. It was a very long trial. It lasted, I think, uh, nearly a month in the, October 1989. Um, but one thing we found, we began to find, which was very alarming. First of all, the judge who was to hear the case was had some position within the judiciary, so he actually chose himself to hear it. And I was told by my lawyers, you can raise objection to this, but we don't recommend it because you'll only annoy the judge and probably deny the other judges, and as I knew nothing about him, I thought, well, all right, so we accepted it. Well, the judge did, turned out to be um, quite unbelievable how he um, interfered on behalf of, of Lord Aldington, 
he was openly hostile to me and described me as a self-styled historian, whereas Lord Alden, he said, was a, uh, a distinguished peer and soldier. Um, I'm sure the jury will understand this. And the witnesses who came from all over the world, um, from Australia, Canada, and the United States, and so on, uh, who were, in many cases, surviving Cossacks or people who suffered in the, uh, from their repatriations <coughs> into this part of the world. Um, when they, they arrived, they were allowed to say how they fell into British hands, but they were forbidden to say what happened to them when they were, not only when they were actually handed, put into the hands of Tito or Stalin, but even what happened when the British um, the soldiers attacked them, rounded them up, put them in cattle trucks, and so on. This was forbidden to be discussed, so the jury wouldn't really have known what was going on. Even the choice of the jury, the judge said, which sounds very strange to me, um, that he'd investigated the backgrounds of the jury uh, and found that they were all very um, highly intelligent people. But I mean, if he investigated that, he could have investigated and done other things too. In fact, they were so practically intelligent about things, not all of them anyway, because there was a black man among them uh, who for some reason couldn't read at all. We knew that, he couldn't read the oath. But the judge said, I don't think that matters. Well, it was a case which involved literally thousands of documents had to be gone through. Now, turning to the documents, we, I began to find that the documents I badly needed, many of them I already had photocopied, but others I knew were relevant to the trial. When I applied at the public record office, I was informed time and again that uh, these have been returned to the department that they came from, the Foreign Office or the Ministry of Defence. So I said, well, when, when will they, they come back? And they said, well, the, the public record office is very sympathetic and said, well, we don't know because they're allowed to do this and to keep them as long as they feel like. So that throughout the trial we were prevented from um, seeing <coughs> many of these very important documents. Now, <coughs> to backtrack very slightly, before the trial, I was um, <coughs> approached by many people, most of them sympathetic, but among them was a man who said, um, I'm, a, I'm a child soldier called Brigadier Cowgill, and um, I'm very interested in this case, and I feel in, the, in particular that Lord Aldrington appears to have behaved very badly, and I wondered if I could come to see you. Well, many people came to see me, I, I never said no. And he, so he came, and he was very, he didn't seem very intelligent, but he was affable, and I told him all about it. And anyway, to cut the story short, one day he said, came to see me, and he said, look, I think I'll, um, I'm thinking of forming a, a committee which will be quite independent and will investigate all the, the, what's happened and publish a report. And this should strengthen your position because it will be a completely independent committee. Well, I thought to myself, I can't really see the point of this because um, the committee isn't important, useful because it's independent. It's useful because it's done all the work and the research. But still, I said, I can, I'll help as much as I can. Well, just before the trial was due to happen, he, he this man, the Brigadier Cargill, published a so-called very official-looking report. Uh, and the gist of the whole report, it just twisted the evidence and so on, <coughs> was to say that um, Lord Orlington was completely innocent and that I had more really uh, distorted the evidence and changed everything. And um, it was I, really, who was guilty and not Lord Orlington. And this was on the eve of the trial, so who can say it, was off, it must have been damaging. Uh, to the effect on the, of the verdict. When the final day came, uh, the, the judge said to the foreman of the jury, do you find um, Count Tolstoy guilty or not guilty? And the foreman said, guilty. And the judge said, how much damages do you award to Lord Orlington? And uh, the, ju the, ju the he'd already advised the jury, he said, don't give Mickey Mouse damages. In other words, don't give small damages. Well, the poor juryman had actually taken this a bit too, too, too much to heart because he said one and a half million pounds, which was three times larger than any other damages award in the whole of British legal history. Um, well, I think they thought, and certainly I received letters. Of course, we were very dismayed, and I remember going back with my wife being very disconsolate. Of course, we haven't got this money. In fact, 
effectively we had no money because we'd had to spend it all in the two or three years preparation for the case when I had to stop writing and just devote myself to this. And my wife went up, I remember the day, next day when they arrived, she went up to the village to get some two chops for our lunch from, from the butcher. And she came in and she asked, and there was a big notice outside the news agent saying, Count Tolstoy fined one and a half million pounds, and my poor wife was embarrassed when she went in the shop. And there was a, a boy of about 17, and she said, I want a couple of chops, so he was chopping the chops. And my wife said nervously, well, I expect you've seen what's happened with my husband. And uh, the, the young chap said, went chop, he said, well, I reckon he was guilty, wasn't he? Meaning Lord Aldington. And my wife said, yes, well, we think so, but what makes you think that? And he went chop, he said, well, somebody gave the order, and I don't think it was a Lance Corporal, which was actually a pretty wise comment, I think, as it came out. Um, immediately uh, um, f f following the um, trial, uh, there was a, a considerable sympathy, and in fact there was a general uh, public concern, was sympathy for us, and there was widespread feeling that the trial had been rigged. Indeed, um, about three months later, a report came out in the newspaper that the judge and Lord Aldington, had their, two, their homes were two, six miles apart, in the countryside, and they both belonged to the same small private golf club, which was next door to their two houses. And we began to hear and more and more, and this came up. Then to our surprise, we suddenly found about a year later, that a new, much more expensive edition of Brigadier Cowgill's report came out. It didn't say anything different from the previous report, but it reiterated in much more, it had lots of photographs of documents and so on, um, uh, elaborate form that I had got everything wrong and um, that this was, um, uh, um, I'd received my just desserts. Well, it so happened, soon after this happened, I, I was at the, we have a, every year uh, a, a, a ball for Russian charities called the War and Peace Ball. And I was there and a cousin of mine was there and his wife. And um, I, I called them Anna Obolensky, famous Russian there, and um, I was telling them all about this Cowgill report and what effect it had on the trial. And she said, well, would you like me to find out about Brigadier Cowgill? And I said, yes, but how do you mean, how would you find out? Well, I've forgotten that she worked for the famous international detective agency, Kroll Associates. She said, I can find out. And a few days later, I've got the letter, she sent me a fax. Um, she said, here's the um, lowdown about Brigadier Cowgirl's report. Well, it turned out he wasn't any ordinary brigadier. In fact, he served in MI6, the British um, Secret Service, from, the, from about the 1950s. And uh, it turned out, that, and then more evidence began to come out, that this report, which was designed to influence the trial, had actually been commissioned by the government at the time. And incidentally, the authors of the report were, they had no historian, which was commented upon, there was Brigadier Cowgill who knew nothing, um, a man called Lord Brimelow. Now Lord Brimelow was one of the four or five foreign office officials who in 1945 had been the most eager to send every single last Russian back to be killed in Russia. And um, later we found, I found more evidence about Lord Brimelow. Um, and the evidence then began to come in thick and fast to the extent to which the British government was involved in fixing the trial and trying to muddy the waters of the whole business. Um, a, um, a, 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 a reporter on the Guardian newspaper, a very nice man, Werner well, came to know, he, rang, he'd interviewed me already several times just about the trial and published reports. Then he suddenly rang me, he said, Nicola, you won't believe what I've just been heard. And I said, why, what is it? And he said, it turned out he'd been telephoned by someone working in the Ministry of Defence. And he said, I know exactly what happened behind the scenes uh, during the trial, and if you like, I'll tell you. And he said, but I can't, you must promise not to give my name. So it was my friend, um, uh, Richard, um, uh, said, well, of course, and so he met him. But this man was so nervous 
But he said, we must, we must walk up and down the embankment by the Thames. I can't talk to you inside a building because it may be barred. And it turned out he was in the Department of the Ministry of Defence, which was given the job of hiding any evidence which might be helpful to our case and damaging to Lord Aldington. And um, this was published by Richard Norton Taylor, his name was, in the, in the newspaper. Of course, he didn't give the man's name, but it showed how they, this was going on. And then shortly after that, I assume it was the same man, my lawyers received a sheaf of documents, copies of documents from the Ministry of Defence, which had a whole correspondence between Lord Aldington, Brigadier Cargill, and the Minister of, and the <coughs> Minister of Defence, a Conservative, needless to say, who were uh, giving details of what they were doing to conceal documents, and actually lists all the documents um, which they removed so that we couldn't use them. And they were absolutely, I've since got hold of them, uh, and they would have been dynamite if we'd been allowed to use them in the trial. But the British government was absolutely determined to protect the reputations. I should say that Lord Aldington, when he was made Lord Aldington by Harold Macmillan after the war, um, he became uh, deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. So there were many links there. Um, we, we had a very long battle, and in many ways I'd say a losing battle. And I, but to show the sort of thing, well, the, the, the British, as my friend Georgi Vasilchikov said, it, the British uh, establishment can turn very nasty. Well, they certainly can. Uh, I had to declare myself bankrupt uh, because we didn't have one, didn't have one and a half thousand pounds, let alone one and a half million pounds. And we then were, the, the, the trustee in bankruptcy, obviously acting in orders, was very anxious to confiscate my library and all my archives, obviously, so I couldn't write another book on the subject. Now, in fact, even under English law, an author's library is called tools of trade and can't be, like, say, an electrician's equipment, can't be confiscated under bankruptcy laws because you need it to keep yourself going. Um, so this, this was, um, law was being broken. They, they sent around someone to, get, to look at my library and catalog it. About it, two years later, the battle was still continuing, um, I had another, uh, there had been something in the newspaper damaging to Lord Aldington. The next day I had a letter from the trustee saying, we're coming to catalog your library again. Well, this, I knew this was just to alarm me, it did alarm me a bit. But I was so angry that I simply wrote back and quoted a letter from my famous relative, Leo Nikolai Tolstoy, when, when once the um, Russian government sent two policemen to search his house because uh, he was supposed to have illegal literature. And he wrote to back to the governor, who he knew, <coughs> who said, I know these two men have been here when I was out. If they come again, I have a pair of pistols and I know how to use them. I just copied this letter and sent it to the trustee of bankruptcy. I never heard another word from them. So they're quite, if you challenge them, they're not there, they can be frightened too. But they are, I would say, horrible people. In a way, collaborators, in the crime. I'm not talking about the entire establishment, obviously, but about the people who run the rules. And I'm sorry to say it was always a conservative government, I suppose, obviously, the connection with Macmillan and Lord Aldington. Now, a good friend of mine who was, uh, she lives in Scotland, was a woman called Zoe Polanska, and she was one of the key witnesses in the book, and will be again in my next book. Um, when she was a 16 year old schoolgirl in Odessa, when the um, uh, German army arrived. And soon after the occupation, um, SS troops came to the school and took her and another, her friend, Tonya, um, and abducted her for forced labor inside the Reich. And she spent the next part of the war, first of all in um, Dachau, and then in Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz, she was experimented upon by this horrible Dr. Mengele. Um, but then one day, about the turn of the year 1944 to 45, an Allied bombing raid destroyed some of the barbed wire around Auschwitz, and several people escaped, including my friend and her, Zoe and her friend. And they managed to get to Vienna, and there in Vienna, some kind nuns looked after them. And then one day they said, Look, we've heard that there are some, a lot of Russians now have 
arrived from Italy in um, Corinthia, and perhaps you'd be best and safe to go to them. So this seemed a good idea. And 